Welcome to the Digital Showcase for Supply Chain Insights Global Summit. I'm interviewing Dean Ocampo today from ERA. And Dean, let's talk about Supply Chain 2030. Lots of people are coming to the conference and they want to know, you know, 2030, what's it look like? What do you think it looks like? Gosh, it's a, it's a great topic, and uh, I won't go into too much detail. I know we just did a podcast that your listeners can, can listen to in detail. Um, but I thought maybe I'd focus a little on the cognitive automation part uh, just in prep for, for your conference, since that's a very interesting topic for a lot of folks. Any questions specifically you want me to go in, or do you want me to just start to dig into cognitive automation? Well, let's talk about cognitive automation. How do you see people using it? And, you know, there's more cognitive computing software companies in the supply chain space than Carter has liver pills. Sorry, Mr. Carter. But, you know, what does ERA do and what's different than the rest of the market? Yeah, I think there's there's a couple of things. So I like to get beyond the buzzwords and think about what the problem we're trying to solve. And, you know, I think the one thing about cognitive automation that's different is it's fundamentally looking at it from a different perspective. So if I look at the state of um, affairs, most folks are trying to go for the control towers, the visualization. And the interesting assumption is that if we do a better job of calling data and putting visualizations and getting into the right people, they will make better decisions and work better together to get to interesting answers. I think there's, there's an interesting more question is, you know, why can't we have the system start taking over some of the decisions? If you think about it, there's a lot of very smart supply chain folks who are doing some very, they're, they're sophisticated modeling and data munging, et cetera, tasks, but they ended up being really repetitive. So why can't we take a system to start sensing and modeling at a faster pace, take over those sophisticated decisions like you would like a self-driving car and let the, the user start thinking about, well, where should I go? Are there different things I can do with this with this vehicle than, um, than I would have done in the past? So we're trying to answer a slightly different question of how do I start letting my systems take over the driving for me? Well, and Dean, maybe you could show us an example of that. I know you have your screen up. Let's let you drive. And, you know, when I used to be a planner, it would take me four to five hours to sort through exceptions. So I used to laugh. I'd get a cup of coffee. I'd go through my exceptions. Then I'd get ready for my one o'clock meeting. I'd do my one to three o'clock meeting. And then I would have all night to work on, you know, my plan. And I'm hoping you take some of that pain out of the system for people. Yeah, it's fun. That's the thing that amazes me about supply chain. There's so many smart folks who are going through the same thing. I ran across this this last week. I seen it with procurement, and exceptions are the non-exception for them. So I've got I met a guy who's got a master's in supply chain, but yet a good chunk of his day is trying to reconcile what comes out of the MRP goes to the PO system. So I don't think you're alone there. There's a lot of like very mundane tasks that our brains could be spending um, uh, better thought process around. So why don't I try and make this real? Let me switch over to my screen. So give me a second. And okay, Laura, can you now see my screen? I can, it's big and real time. I got 13 open exceptions. Are you gonna solve those for me? You know, what I would actually think is interesting is I always feel like a demo of cognitive automation is a little bit misleading because if you do the processes right, actually it's like self-driving. It's taking care of a lot of the day-to-day the -day tasks for you. But, um, you know, I'm going to try and pretend like uh, I'm a, a user, maybe the cognitive automation is new for them. So typically I see the first phase is um, decision assistant where you know, the system isn't making recommendations for you, um, but it's bringing them to you for you to make them. So. Uh, in that case, cognitive animation for me would mean my day basically only starts with something as simple as this. So in the background, it has gone through and has constantly look at signals. It's starting, it's looking constantly at performance. It's running modeling in the background. It's looking for exceptions and then triggering different actions on modeling. And so I can wake up in the day and say overnight, hey, are there anything I should look at? And this one, in this case, is looking at my supply and demand and looking for mismatches and back orders. And so I can start waking up and seeing, okay, am I start seeing a mismatch? Do I need to think about a couple things about, do I need about shifting inventory? Do I need to think about increasing production somewhere? Do I need to think about changing my forecast, et cetera? And almost like a sophisticated, say like I brought an intern with a master's in supply chain, it's doing that thinking for you overnight. So I can start getting into 
my my uh, workbench here, and I can start looking at okay, uh, good morning, Arrow. What's 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 the first thing you got for me? And um, it's pretty straightforward. So in this case, it's through the analysis has come back to me and says, hey, you know what? Based on what I'm seeing in both your performance and the market, I'm suggesting actually you take for your specific logo product um, uh, increased production in your Sao Paulo plant by this number of units, and you will actually solve 50, 57% of your calculated back orders, right? So it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, the first time I saw this was like, okay, that's okay, that's, that can't be real. But that's part of also the beauty of, of, of how we're approaching cognitive automation is this should also have explainability, just like if I were asked a new intern, explain to me your thought reasoning. So just like before, I can see all the data that's pulled together, and I can see in this case, it's showing me my prediction versus consensus and where there's a mismatch. It's also then showing me um, in my end-to-end -end cycle time is how long does it take me to move through manufacturing stages? So I actually can start thinking about things when I actually will arrive in my inventory and do those predictions as well. Um, and then I can start running some interesting modeling. So in this case, you see this example of we're predicting versus via the model that it's gonna be a back order. Well, how in the world do you get that? Well, you can start getting the, the details. And this is where I have a couple of clients that are actually using this to run very sophisticated models, both a combination of statistical, linear, and in some cases now, neural algorithms to go look at, um, I think in your terms, you call it backcasting, and look at what's happened in the past, put a best fit model around it, then test against the bias error, and the system will then automatically figure out from the bias error, here's what I recommend based on the best model, where you're actually gonna start running across um, a supply and demand mismatch. You've got some very, sophisticated and there's something like 20 algorithms being run in each one of these uh, SKU location pairs that ultimately then lead into my, I need to move my window out of the way, there we go. They're ultimately gonna lead into um, the decision that I'll make for um, and the recommendation, right? So that's a, about as simple as it gets. Um, and then I as a user, I can look at this and if I agree to it, I can go ahead and accept. And then what this is gonna do is, is actually gonna write back to the transaction system. Um, just like we talked in our pad, podcast uh, earlier, which your, your listeners can, can go listen to is, is this is an overlay model where now I am taking intelligence above it across different systems, taking the intelligence, forecasting, et cetera. And then this is interfacing with folks making predictions and actually doing execution. So in this case, I can send the um, production work order back to uh, Sao Paulo and I can put a, a notification tree here as well. So very sophisticated. Um, and I can actually start automating this. Our customers, usually what they do is they start giving over decision authority based on um, certain value sets for for the decisions. And I start moving truly into that um, uh, uh, self learning model. Now, for those folks who like to know a little more about underneath that, again, that's kind of the day-to-day -day view. Um, there's, let me show you a little bit about <clears throat> the sophistication underneath. So typically what I see is, uh, the end user will have an interface, and then there's a set of business users who really understand the process flow and the desired. And this is where some of the like really cool cutting edge technology comes in. You can start seeing that I'm starting to model thought processes inside um, uh, the cognitive automation. So you can see here, this is everything that led up to what you saw before. So I've actually got a pretty sophisticated pieces of information that um, at the end of the day, execute commands to grab sales data, grab purchasing data, grab production data, grab inventory data, grab all the data sets that you need, normalize it, and then execute demand forecast. And this actually branches off into another set of logic that actually executes um, those 20 algorithms and looks for best fits. Then use that information, it starts um, asking itself, okay, let's, let's look at inventory in the future and do I expect their excess? Okay, if there's excess, there's certain things I want to look for to, to try and avoid and minimize as much as possible to want to rebalance. So I actually need to do some liquidation action. If I have inventory shortages, what should I do there? Do I want to do more rebalancing? Do I want to look for substitutions? Do I want to actually look at stuff that's inbound that I want to, want to go ahead and expedite? Do I want to change and communicate with the customers? Do I want to issue a uh, production order? And that's where the rule that you saw before was invoked here go ahead, um, we've got enough lead time, let's go ahead and put a production order here and feed back to the end user. So you're starting to see here, even though they're pretty doing a, a fairly complex uh, thought process here, it's actually pretty straightforward for the business users. 
And even behind that, there's usually a set of users who are just trying to figure out how do I get data together, and I won't go too much into here. But we've essentially um, mastered how you put crawlers that go into systems, ERP, that are data aware of uh, SAP, of Oracle, which tables to look for, which fields, and then go in at the end of the day, uh, fill in this common data model. So I don't necessarily have to worry about which, which SAP instance it came from. It took over the job of finding which table and SAP instances, um, calling those together and letting them all come into a unified data model which then gets fed back into those processes, which get back, back fed into those, those automations. So even though at the end of the day, you see a very simple interface for how folks interface from day to day, there's a lot of um, uh, background work that the system does on, on your behalf. And that's a kind of a very quick view of what kind of automation looks like in real life. Well, thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you at the Global Summit, and hopefully people will come with lots of great questions for you because we are so ready to have the supply chain on the road for self-driving. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Hey, thanks, Laura. Take care. Uh -huh. Bye now.